Good morning, everyone. I want to thank the audience here and also online for um, coming to this side event entitled the 2030 Global Agenda for Sepsis for the Attainment of the Sustainable Development Goal. This uh, session is convened in parallel to the 79th session of the UN General Assembly. I am Dr. Connie Newman. I'm an endocrinologist. I'm the MWIA representative to the United Nations. And I'm also the MWIA vice president for the North American region. And I'm an adjunct professor at NYU School of Medicine. Our event is organized by four co-sponsor agencies, the Medical Women's International Association, MWIA, the Global Sepsis Alliance, the Unite Parliamentarians Network for Global Health, and also the German Sepsis Foundation. So why are we here today? Well, I think many of us know that sepsis is an extremely, um, it's not extremely rare, but it's an extremely dangerous condition to have and still healthcare providers, not just doctors, but all healthcare providers do not recognize the symptoms and globally one in five deaths are due to sepsis. The treatment is antibiotics if the infection is bacterial. It doesn't have to be bacterial. But right now we're facing um, antimicrobial resistance, which makes it harder to treat. So the main objectives of this meeting are to present the 2030 Global Agenda on Sepsis as the first multi-year global strategy on how to reduce the significant human, societal, economic, and healthcare burden of sepsis. The second objective, to reach consensus on the urgent need for reinvigorating the sepsis responses at global, regional, and national levels for the attainment of the 2030 SDGs. The third objective, to discuss the critical role of healthcare workers, especially the medical women, in the promotion and implementation of the 2030 agenda. And finally, to call for establishment of a high level political forum for sepsis to lead integration of sepsis into the mainstream of health and development dialogue and architecture, including the G7 and G20 summits, the World Health Assemblies, the UN General Assemblies, and World Economic Forums. I'm now going to introduce uh, the first speaker. I'm introducing the Honorable Ricardo Baptista Light. He is president of the Unite Parliamentarians Network for Global Health and CEO of the Health AI Agency. Dr. Light is the former member of parliament of Portugal and was recently selected as the Obama Foundation's leader for Europe. Thank you so much for that kind of introduction and good morning, everyone. It's a, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. I mean, the, this these weeks are really hard. Uh, I, I did 22,000 steps yesterday. And so it's, it's really pushing on all of us. So just being here is really a commitment to global health to multilateralism and to and to pushing the topics that truly speak to our heart forward. And today uh, I'm very honored as founder and president of the Unite Parliamentarians Network to be joining efforts uh, in, in the name of our organization with the Global Sepsis Alliance and with different partners around uh, this cause, which is so critical. And that is center stage with the high level meeting that is uh, upcoming this Thursday, tomorrow, uh, here at the, the United Nations um, uh, headquarters. Of course, uh, we have a, a small conflict of interest here because the president of uh, the Global Sepsis Alliance, uh, Miriam Jashi, is also a member of the board of UNITE. And uh, th that helps a lot as uh, uh, working together as a former parliamentarian and a true global leader. It's been, a, it's been an honor to be a witness to your work and how you are taking sepsis to, to the global stage uh, even further. And uh, we are very proud to be able to support those efforts. You know, I, I represent parliamentarians. When you look at the trust level uh, towards different professions, parliamentarians are at the bottom of the list. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I'm also a physician, which typically is at the top of the list. So you can trust me halfway. And uh, what I can say is that I, I, my background is in infectious diseases. I know we have sepsis survivors within the group. And um, I, I want to say how much it, it really touches to, to our hearts 
and our spirits, the, um, the impact that sepsis has sometimes without people really understanding that true impact. And um, having seen it firsthand as a physician many years ago, back in Portugal when I was working at our NHS, or even more recently, uh, working uh, as a volunteer in Lviv during the war effort uh, as a humanitarian uh, medical volunteer in, in Ukraine, where working in um, an ICU for uh, newborn babies, seeing the devastating impact of sepsis, but also some survivor stories that give us hope. That being said, we need to do more. If I talk with le leaders, with policymakers around the world, they don't know what I'm talking about most of the time. Just yesterday, we had a, a session talking about AMR uh, in low and middle income countries, UMA. And this is a, these are very difficult topics to, to discuss. And sepsis, of course, AMR is a very important part of sepsis because it goes far beyond uh, antimicrobial resistance. But since we have this opportunity with the high level meeting, our position has been this then, let's use this as an opportunity to take all of these related topics uh, a next step forward. And that's why we need a roadmap. The declaration that will come out of the, the, the discussions next Thursday will be critical as a checklist of things that we need to accomplish. But I would say that the 2030 global agenda for sepsis is critical. And that's why we have decided to uh, subscribe it. But more than that, we look at it as our own action plan. So now we have a document that we can use collectively to be able to push this agenda forward when it comes to policy change, when it comes to promoting policy actions. And parliamentarians have such a tremendous role that many times are forgotten within the UN multilateral system. You know, parliamentarians are able to approve budgets, get money where it's needed. That's kind of important. But it's also important, and you know, when if it, it's not just about research and development, which is critical, we need to develop new antibiotics. It's also making sure that the health systems are, are prepared to deal with these challenges. But it's also getting the policies and legislation approved. It's building coalitions uh, of the willing to move the agenda forward. And it's representing the people. And in that sense, we need the parliamentarians to step up and keep their governments accountable. We've all been to too many high level meetings where we sign a declaration and then that declaration ends up in the in a, in, in a shelf somewhere or in a, in a drawer somewhere. We need to make sure, and that's our responsibility. It's nobody else's. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We have to use whatever comes out of that declaration as a roadmap to make sure that we push the parliamentarians to keep the governments accountable to what they are signing on to. And that I think is what can be the most positive outcome. That's what gives me hope and gives me the strength uh, uh, and to all of us really to move forward. I just want to say that UNITE, which is a network of current and former legislators from 112 countries, is organizing the UNITE Global Summit, uh, which is our flagship event next uh, October, uh, in partnership with the World Health Summit in Berlin. And uh, of course, we'll all be there, but I'm particularly happy to see sepsis on our agenda uh, through a partnership between UNITE and the, the Global Sepsis Alliance. And so it's a platform where we're bringing parliamentarians from around the world to be able to discuss precisely this topic. And it's not your typical conference. It's not where specialists go and they're, they can say what they want. No, we, we grill them. And I'll tell you how. Uh, what we do is we're going to organize on stage what we call parliamentary inquiries. So you will be, if you're in the audience, you'll be watching as if it were a congressional hearing where the parliamentarians will be asking questions to the specialists. And so there's a level of commitment from, from both the specialists and the political leaders so that they, after that, hopefully can join forces towards uh, achieving action. My last note is on the pandemic accord. Uh, we went through a terrible pandemic with devastating economic, social health consequences, and yet the world seems to not want to talk about pandemics anymore. The next pandemic will be related to antimicrobial resistance, will be related to the topic we are discussing exactly in this room, yet political leaders tend to uh, want to step away from this discussion. We need to continue to fight for a pandemic accord. We need a document that incorporates these issues and that sepsis is clearly um, discussed as part of this uh, global agreement. And so that we are better prepared, hopefully to avoid the next pandemic. It is in our hands to build that future together. And I, and I truly believe that the alliance of organizations that, uh, that has come here together is really one that can forge that future 
And so we are very proud once again, to be associated with you, with all of the organizations here, with the global agenda for sepsis. And as we like to say at our organization, it's time to unite. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Light. I am now going to introduce um, a woman physician who is a distinguished advocate, educator, and president of the Medical Women's International Association, Dr. Eleanor Watanobe. She is also co-founder of the Every Woman Treaty, a coalition advocating for ending violence against women and girls, Dr. Watanobe. Thank you so very much, Connie. Truly a delight to be here at this very important gathering to discuss the 2030 Global Agenda for Sepsis for attaining sustainable development goals. I thank the co-organizers, the Global Sepsis Alliance, Unite Parliamentarians, Sepsis Stiftung, and of course, the Medical Women's International Association. We are an association that prides itself in our strength of advocacy, especially in matters of women's global health. Dear friends, health is not only wealth, health is peace, including peace of mind. We have somebody invited here today who couldn't make it on account of being unwell. That shows us the importance of health. We know the issues of sepsis, and you are going to tell us more about the sobering statistics. But we are in a time and place where a few blocks from here, the United Nations General Assembly is ongoing. We know it. Dr. Ricardo spoke of the number of steps he made yesterday. The roads were blocked. Some of us had to walk 10, 20 blocks because we couldn't get from point A to point B. I had the rare privilege of sitting, albeit up on the fourth balcony for the General Assembly yesterday. That's where they put civil society, but that's fine. We're in the room. And in those hallowed chambers, what came to mind to me is how those hallowed chambers have become an echo chamber. Our world leaders, leaders, the most powerful personalities of their countries and the speeches were more or less the same. Speaking, verbalizing about the crises that we are facing, the crises of the COVID pandemic, and other health emergencies, the crises that include climate issues, crises that include the big elephant in the room at the moment, conflict. And something for our time, cyber innovations and AI. So we have the confluence of these crises, the four C's, and they all spoke to them. I was waiting to hear how they would act upon them, how they would lock themselves in a room and not exit until those crises had been resolved. We know they can't be resolved in a day, but we are looking for action. You might say, how is that related to sepsis? 
Well, here's the thing. I also had the rare opportunity of having a one-on-one -on -one discussion with the Director General of the World Health Assembly, Dr. Pedros Gabriesos. And I asked one question, I said, Doctor, what would you like the Medical Women's International Association to do to help your vision? His answer was very simple. Use your power of advocacy to get countries to put health for all in their constitutions. Health for all in our constitutions. The constitutions are the grand norm. Dr. Ricardo just spoke eloquently about the place of parliamentarians. So I want to leave this message with us today that we should not just continue looking to our governments. We, the people, need to engage with our parliamentarians because they are the lawmakers. We need to engage with the chairs of the health committees in the House and the Senate. Once we have health for all in the constitution with the text and the data that those of you who are the experts in sepsis will bring the data concerning sepsis and other issues around health for which nobody should be left behind. That data will form the reason for which our parliamentarians will prioritize the health for all amendments in the constitution of every country. Once you have that as a law in the grand norm, what immediately follows it, and our parliamentarians will tell us better, is budgetary appropriation. And once you have ring-fenced, dedicated budgeting, then we will be able to operationalize our 2030 global agenda for sepsis. I will conclude with a proverb from my country, the Igbo tribe. That proverb says, and this is in the context of our villages where the farmers go to the farm, our seniors and elders stay home, and the livestock are tied to a tether so they are not stolen or they don't run away. And the proverb says, the elders must not sit and watch a pregnant goat go into labor whilst she is still tethered. What does that say, my friends? In this sphere of sepsis, as we want to actualize our 2030 global agenda for sepsis, we are the elders in this matter. There is a goat there that is squirming and writhing in pain, in labor, and it behoves on us. We have the assignment, we have the ability to go and untie that goat as she is in labor so that she can assume a comfortable position in which to give birth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nwadanobi. Now I'd like to introduce Professor Conrad Reinhardt, who is joining us online he is the president of the German Sepsis Foundation, 
and the founding president of the Global Sepsis Alliance. Professor Reinhardt has been the driving force of the Global Sepsis Advocacy for the last 14 years, including the adoption of the historic World Health Assembly Resolution on Sepsis in 2017. So it's my great pleasure and honor to speak to you again on this issue. And I am humbled by the great speeches that we just heard from Ricardo Leito and our beloved president of the Women's International Association. The tragedy is that sepsis can affect anyone, including celebrities. However, those who are most in need are those in the global south. If you look at this global sepsis paper, that came to the conclusion that at least 20% of all deaths worldwide are attributable to sepsis. You will figure out that the global south, that in some countries there, the incidence of sepsis is between three and 4,000 per 100,000 population, which means that in those countries, the crude mortality rate, if you assume a mortality rate from sepsis of approximately 30%, that still the mortality rate there is as high in, the, in these countries as it was in the US in several, several years ago or, or at the turn of the 19th uh, century in the US. In 1900, the crude mortality rate for sepsis or infectious diseases was 800 per 100,000 uh, population. This is still lower than which is currently in the global south. However, given to the introduction of measures for global and not for global health, for but for public health as sanitation, as chlorination of water, as providing medications, uh, uh, vaccination, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Crude mortality rate decreased from 800 to around 50 to 60 per 100 population in the 50s and 70s, and this decrease was only interrupted by the so-called Spanish flu. And ironically, this resulted in the notion that the fight against infectious diseases can be closed. However, sepsis is not only an issue in high in low income countries, but also in countries like US, Sweden, and Germany, the incidence of sepsis is as high as seven to 100,000 population. And also there, most of the deaths from sepsis are preventable. For example, in Australia, crude mortality rate from sepsis decreased between 2000 and 2012 from 35% to around 19 to 18%, just by measures as to educate and implement and make it mandatory what is called rapid response systems, which means educating healthcare workers and physicians in the early detection of deteriorating patients. During this period, overall hospital mortality rates in the state of South Wales decreased by 16%. And yet by measures like which are standard in the air industry, which is critical incidence reporting, where it is mandatory. In Australia, it was figured out that there are still quite a number of issues in terms of preventable sepsis deaths. 
And after this, it, they introduced quality improvement campaigns, which by educating healthcare workers in the emergency departments in all hospitals in New South Wales, which resulted again in a decrease of sepsis mortality from 19% to 14%. And most recently in the state of Victoria, again by a quality improvement campaign, which was called Think Sepsis, Act Fast, there hospital mortality from sepsis was reduced from 17% down to 11%. And this came along with savings of 11 million Australian dollars and compared to an investment of 1.7 million Australian dollars uh, for the campaign, this means return of investment of 600%. And unfortunately, despite the fact that the WHO sepsis resolution, which was adopted in 2017, and which also referred to the fact that most of the deaths from sepsis are preventable, still up to now only 10% of the countries had implemented and integrated sepsis in their national healthcare systems. That's why I'm so pleased that now there's more discussion on the need that in every country this must happen because it's not only a human request, but it's also an economic request because we are not only talking about deaths from sepsis, but also on the fact that 75% of the survivors suffer from long-term sequelae. And uh, that's why this is what we have discussed uh, and put together in this global agenda and needs to be brought to action. And I thank you so much for your attention. And finally, I want to encourage you to support our, indeed, our vision, zero preventable deaths from sepsis. Of course, thank you. It is now my pleasure and honor to introduce to you, Dr. Mariam Jashi, CEO of the Global Sepsis Alliance, the Secretary General of the Medical Women's International Association, the former member of parliament and Deputy Health Minister of Georgia. Dr. Jashi will present the 2030 Global Agenda for Sepsis launched at the German parliament on September 10. Thank you so much. I'm really humbled and extremely grateful that you joined us today as we have over 500 side events and sessions of the ongoing 79th UN General Assembly this week. And it's, it's also disappointing, but this is the status quo that will definitely change, that sepsis takes one in five lives globally, and yet only one out of 500 plus events discusses sepsis during the UN General Assembly. So this is something that we hope to change, but we can only change it through our joint partnerships. Um, I'm extremely grateful to Ricardo for joining us in person and for, as always, uh, inspiring discussions and um, statements. Eleanor Nordinobe, thank you so much for making sure that Medical Women's International Association, thanks to our dear Connie Newman, the vice president, was the one who made this meeting possible <clears throat> um, uh, on the margins of the UN General Assembly. And of course, it's wonderful to hear from Professor Conrad Reinhardt, who has been the, the mastermind behind all what we see in the World Sepsis Day movement, in the World Sepsis Congresses, in the WHA resolutions. And allow me now to very briefly present the document that we are extremely proud to have launched two weeks ago at the German Parliament with the support of our esteemed colleague, 
chapter chair for Unite Parliamentarians Network, Professor Andrew Ullman, who is also the chair of the very first Global Health Subcommittee at the German Bundestag. So the Global Agenda for Sepsis was launched uh, in partnership with the United Parliamentarians Network, with Virchow Foundation and Sepsis Stiftung, and summarizes and consolidates the existing global burden, human, societal, and economic burden of sepsis, um, achievements, as well as remaining challenges in the fight against sepsis, and the way forward uh, across five strategic pillars of the document. The document summarizes that sepsis is taking one in every five deaths. The sepsis is the cause of one in every five deaths. Sepsis affects almost 50, five zero million children, women, and men globally. Sepsis accounts for 13.7 million deaths. And those 13 million deaths include almost 5 million antimicrobial related deaths. And it's astonishing that at the high level meeting on AMR, we don't hear about sepsis. Sepsis affects 20 million under five children, 5.7 million pregnant women every year. Sepsis is responsible for 5 million deaths of non-communicable diseases and injuries as the secondary infectious complications of those conditions. And 78% of COVID-19 patients in intensive care units were affected by viral sepsis. Any future pandemic will be the increasing, we will, we will see increased risk of infectious diseases and sepsis, and yet we don't see sepsis on the agenda of pandemic accord or antimicrobial resistance. How can we achieve sustainable development goals for reduction of maternal, neonatal, child mortality, for reduction of non-communicable diseases and injuries, or for improving um, response to antimicrobial resistance if we don't address sepsis. And in addition to the health-related SDGs, sepsis is related to eight other sustainable development goals. Poverty. There is a direct correlation between the poor social and economic status of um, patients and poor clinical outcomes of sepsis. Sepsis affects more women, 26 million women every year, versus 22 million men. So we definitely have a gender, uh, a gender there. And surprisingly, even countries with a high gender parity and gender equality index like Sweden, they have gender gap in timely accessibility to the first hour time critical treatment, the so-called sepsis bundle. Women are less likely to receive these life-saving sepsis bundles than men within the first hour of emergency treatment. Sepsis fuels inequalities. 85% of the sepsis burden affects low and middle income countries. And the poorest households are affected the most and the poor households in high income countries are affected the most. And emergency agenda. Today we have 120 ongoing armed conflicts globally. We have 362 million people, children, women, and men in need of humanitarian assistance and displaced. And each of those individuals are, to, are subject to increased risk of sepsis. And we need to make sure that both the pandemic accord and any other emergency response plans address sepsis to uh, adequately protect their lives. So what has been done till today in the sepsis response? First of all, the 2017 World Health Assembly resolution was the historic point that Global Sepsis Alliance was happy to lead in terms of advocacy and Germany and four other German speaking countries have sponsored the historic World Health Assembly resolution. But seven years after the 2017 health resolution, the sepsis resolution, 
only 15 countries, one five, less than 10% of the UN member states have prioritized sepsis. And we only see success stories in high income countries, Australia, United States, United Kingdom, Sweden, and the low and middle income countries affected the most are the least to benefit from the state of the art knowledge in sepsis clinical management or evidence generation. So uh, our common obligation, if we are ambitious to truly attain sustainable development goals, if we are really serious about attaining universal health coverage aspirations or maternal and neonatal child health aspirations, we have to put sepsis in the mainstream of the political agenda. We have to make sure that at least 80% of UN member states develop national action plans for sepsis or integrate sepsis core elements in the broader national health policies and strategies. We have to make sure that similar to the United Kingdom, Australia, or um, Sweden, countries develop the so-called sepsis clinical pathways, how the patient can navigate from the community alert systems to the first touch of primary healthcare providers, emergency medical services, hospital wards, ICU if needed, and how they are also guided from the ICU during the recovery, hopefully, to, to the wards and home with post-sepsis care and rehabilitation. So the continuum of care and quality of care of the sepsis clinical management is key. The Global Sepsis Alliance, the Alliance um, developed this document in consultations with 70 stakeholders globally. We have engaged both public, private, academic, and civil society partners, and our incredible sepsis survivors from different countries have been part of the discussions. And we were honored to launch this document at the German parliament as noted two weeks ago. So now we have the slides too. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I, I will not repeat what we have already discussed. So, so and this is the, the picture of the German Bundestag launch of our a historic document. It was really an inspiring event. And we were feeling the beginning of an important turning point for our global fight. We really hope that other parliamentarians, other policymakers across the world will follow the example of the German Bundestag. And we were delighted to have a special video address from Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, Director General of the World Health Organization. Dear colleagues and friends, guten Tag allerseits. WHO congratulates the Global Sepsis Alliance on the launch of the 2030 Global Agenda for Sepsis. This is a valuable tool in our shared work to prevent the suffering caused by sepsis, which kills 11 million people every year, including children, older people, and other vulnerable groups in low-income countries. The global agenda is well aligned with WHO's work on sepsis. We have made good progress in raising awareness about sepsis, but we can and must do more. Millions of lives can be saved with proven, affordable interventions that are feasible in every context. WHO is supporting countries to improve the prevention, early recognition, and timely treatment of sepsis. We're implementing the Global Action Plan on Infection Prevention and Control we're developing new guidelines on clinical management, and our sepsis toolkit supports communities and countries to strengthen emergency and critical care, improve outcomes, and save lives. We thank the Global Sepsis Alliance for your close partnership and leadership on this issue, and we're deeply grateful to Germany for its long-standing support. Vielen Dank. 
We look forward to our continued partnership to reduce the preventable burden of suffering caused by sepsis. This was a very important video address from WHO Director General. We're extremely grateful to his support, who personally congratulated the Global Sepsis Alliance for the launch of the 2030 Agenda and expressed hope that we continue close collaboration on this important direction and uh, undertaking. So as discussed, um, we, we are grateful to the Unite Parliamentarians Network Medical Women's Clinton Health Access Initiative, Sepsis Tipton, the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership and Virchow Foundation, who have co-sponsored the very first sepsis site events of the UN General Assembly last year, the World Health Summit and WHA in Geneva in May. And our global and regional sepsis alliance from Africa, Europe, Asia, Pacific, Eastern Mediterranean, Latin American, Caribbeans have been part of the process. We have already discussed the statistics, but please picture those numbers. 48.9 million cases, 13.7 million deaths. And again, we spoke that without sepsis, it would be impossible to attain health-related sustainable development goals, as well as poverty, gender, inequality, water and sanitation, and um, uh, climate change related uh, aspirations. And this is the slide that I would like to once again highlight it. 4.95 million AMR related deaths are only part of the 13.66 million sepsis related deaths. That is the data from the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation. And unfortunately, we don't see those figures in our discussions. As mentioned, success stories are coming primarily from the high income countries. We have 15 countries with national action plans and six countries that have um, endorsed national campaigns and capacity building initiatives. And sepsis survivors and family members have been driving forces of all historic changes. Economic aspects of sepsis, um, 36,000 euro per patient, per hospitalization cost globally. And that is only 20 to 30% of the total societal costs of sepsis. And we hear from Australia that sepsis investments have at least six-fold return on investment. Uh, Australia not only managed to reduce hospital mortality by 50%, but to have major return on investment. Or Canada, the British Columbia Sepsis Initiative. For every dollar invested in the Sepsis Initiative, Canada reported return of investment of $112. And United States, New York State Sepsis Quality Improvement Initiative that we will hear more today from Sierra and Staunton and our colleagues from Sepsis um, Alliance has already saved 16,000 lives only in New York state. And while we have li very limited data from low and middle income countries, Vietnam, for example, documented that 47% of septic patients mm -hmm. and 56% of families who lost their loved ones due to septic shock went through in, uh, catastrophic, impoverishing expenditures to sepsis. So sepsis is definitely Direct, directly related to universal health coverage and financial health protection agenda. Unfortunately, because of the technical inputs, we don't have the time to go into the details of the five strategic pillars, but we will be working on political leadership and multilateralism. And the next step would be establishment of the high level political platform for sepsis to make sure that sepsis becomes on the agenda of G7, G20, United Nations General Assembly, World Health Assemblies, et cetera. We have to create multilateral cooperation. We have to create funding. Sepsis is not only invisible, it's underfunded, under-resourced massively. So we have to create domestic budgetary resources. We have to create official development assistance through B or multilateral collaboration or public-private partnerships like Gavi, Global Fund, or UNITAID. We have to focus on health system readiness for sepsis and its sequelae. 
both through protocols, quality improvement, training, and synergies with AMR, WASH, infectious prevention uh, control, and other initiatives. We need whole of society approach to sepsis to make sure that sepsis is identified as a medical emergency similar to the heart attack. So immediate erections are needed. Sepsis research and inno innovations for new vaccines, early diagnostics, new antibiotic, antiviral, antifungal, antiparasitic therapies, and post-sepsis care and rehabilitation commodities. And sepsis in pandemics and other emergencies, as I mentioned, would be the next um, strategic pillar. I encourage you to visit the Global Sepsis Alliance website where you can download the PDF version of the document. And please join us in endorsing the document and most importantly, in implementing the new global agenda. Thank you. Now we're going to invite our distinguished speakers for comments and interventions on the 2030 Global Agenda. First, joining us online is Mr. Kieran Staunton. Okay, founder of the Ensepsis, the legacy of Rory Staunton Foundation. Mr. Staunton and his wife, after their tragedy, have been the driving forces of change, first in New York State and now at the federal level, advocating for regulatory changes in laws. But let us hear more from Mr. Staunton now. Good morning. Uh, first of all, congratulations, Miriam, uh, on this tremendous success on getting sepsis on the global agenda for 2030. You have absolutely done fantastic work in the last time. We, I know we've had many meetings with you from in sepsis. And I suppose to start off as the catalyst for this movement in the United States was the death of our son, Rory Staunton, of sepsis. What we've done in New York State is we'd introduced Rory's regulations Miriam mentioned earlier that it had saved 16,000 lives in New York. Well, it saved 16,000 lives in the first four years of introduction. And we will have new figures coming up on that shortly. And that will bring us right up until many years later. And we will talk later about the federal regulations being introduced. For any of the ones to look at Roy's regulations, it's a template that can be used. Versions of it have already been used in five other states here that are covering 50 million people. It can be used around the world. And sepsis is an equal opportunity killer. It's from cradle to grave. And I think, as we've often said, we're not looking for a cure for sepsis, as we've proven here. We are looking for leadership. An earlier speaker also mentioned about appropriations. It's very important because various governments will say we can pass something, but how do we fund it? What we did last year is we got the United States government to give appropriations to CDC, give them funding so they could introduce the core elements. And in the core elements, they'll fit to go into the hospitals and say, here's what we need. So the hospitals in America have already heard from CDC and they're looking into this from so that is very, very important. As Conrad has said earlier, and we have continuously said, any language that has been passed needs to have teeth, needs to have protocols. It's not good enough for any international parliament to pass a resolution or anything like that. What they need to do is say is, here's what we've done in New York. Just around the world, we are the only government that has actually can prove we are saving many, many lives. Now, we were in Washington two weeks ago and having been worked in government here for over 30 years, we know that if you're going to introduce legislation, A, it has got to have support, B, it has to have teeth in it, and C, it's got to be fit to pass. Our legislation that we introduced last week is supported by both sides of the aisle. We've also met with CDC on it, and we've met with the hospital groups across the country. So... The, the word is coming down that there is sepsis legislation with teeth that's going to be operation from coast to coast. And I think it was from the death of our son was the catalyst here in America that got it at state level, got Senate hearings, got other states, and we want to keep it moving, moving in other countries and moving with Miriam at the UN, at WHO, at all the various groups. And finally, I will just say, because I know we're short on time, is another step that we succeeded in last week in the White House had its health and safety event. Now, this year, for the first time ever, sepsis was on the agenda. My wife and I and daughter were asked to address that very, very powerful event. 
And we did with enormous success when you got the United States White House involved in this. Those are the steps we have taken and I'm hoping that others around the world, because as I said to our leader, uh, one of our people, colleagues in another country yesterday, the longest journey begins with the shortest step. People shouldn't have to bury their children to be involved in this. But let's do it and let's save lives. Thank you very much. And congratulations again, Mary. Darren, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, I, I know um, last week was especially busy for you. Um, and it's always difficult to speak after you because after all these years, the pain that you and Arlene are going through, it's uh, unbearable. And thank you for, for helping others and saving lives uh, after, after all you have gone through. And we, we have seen it in um, the New York state and we now see with the sepsis bill that has been submitted to the US Senate. So immense gratitude and we, we, we are definitely de determined to take this further, and I hope that next year's will uh, will definitely show us a major difference in the global sepsis response. Thank you, Sarah, and once again. It's a pleasure Let working with you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Now let me um, give the floor to Thomas Heyman, President and CEO of the Sepsis Alliance. And Sepsis Alliance was the first US-based sepsis organization Founded by dear Dr. Carl Fletley, who unfortunately also became the lead advocate for sepsis awareness after losing her daughter, Erin Fletley. Uh, since 2007, the foundation has emerged as the leading nation platform for capacity building of healthcare workers and awareness raising. And it's wonderful, Tom, to have you here. We know that you have a national forum going on in parallel to this meeting, but Wonderful to have you in person. Thanks. Thank you so much. And thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, we do have a conference going on in parallel, a virtual conference, uh, training 3,000 healthcare professionals to be more better tuned in to sepsis. Yeah, we were started in out of a tragedy, as so many organizations are, and, and I am so grateful to the work that Karen and Orlith are doing. It's it's monumental, and it's great to be in the fight with strong partners like, like them. Um, Sepsis Alliance founded out of a tragedy, and um, we realized early on that this was not something that could be addressed only within the borders of the United States. That made no sense. Uh, uh, bacteria do not obey borders. Borders are permeable. So in 2010, we partnered with two other organizations to form what became the Global Sepsis Alliance, and it's probably one of the best things we've ever done. Now, with about 100 different um, groups participating uh, globally, we can all work together, we can all support one another, and we are so much stronger together. Yeah, so the burden of sepsis um, in the U.S., you know, clearly a bigger problem in LMICs, but certainly a huge problem. We're number one in all the wrong things. Number one cause of death in U.S. hospitals. One out of three people die in a hospital in the U.S. It's related to sepsis. Uh, number one cost of hospital care in the U.S., which you would think would, would draw greater attention to this. Um, 14,000 amputations each year, including one of our board members and someone I was at Capitol Hill with last, last week, two weeks ago, quadruple amputee from Georgia. She didn't know the symptoms. Her healthcare professionals were not tuned in. She ended up losing all four of her limbs. Just tragic. Uh, sepsis survivors, including those amputees, much more likely to face significant ongoing challenges. Return to work, we just did a survey of 3,000 sepsis survivors, not back to work in a month, six months, a year, many not back to work ever. Think of the workplace productivity costs of that. Maternal sepsis, tragically, we've moved up from number three to number two in the U.S., number two cause of maternal mortality in this country. In my state of New Jersey, Black women are nine times more likely to die during childbirth as a result of childbirth than white women, nine times. Nationally, it's three to one. So children, of course, more, more children are dying of sepsis than cancer in the U.S., and we know more people are dying of sepsis than cancer globally in total. So why are we not getting any attention that we deserve? Obviously, sepsis is a big problem, and in the U.S., it disproportionately impacts people of color, lower income, lower educated folks, an even bigger problem there. And AMR, we know, is driving an increase in sepsis deaths globally. Um, I, I met with uh, Commissioner of Health from Malawi yesterday. She said that of 60,000 sepsis deaths in the past year, 30%, a third were, re were related to AMR. So it's, it's really very, very dramatic. It gets personal very quickly. 
So some good news, people can't fight against something they've never heard of before. So when we got started, Microsoft did not have the word sepsis in its dictionary. It was a spell check error. And only 19% of US adults had even heard the word before. How do you gain, how do you gain momentum and traction when no one's even heard of what you're talking about? So good news, we do an annual awareness survey. Uh, last week, we reported 69% people have now at least heard the word. So that allows you to start coalitions. We have 10,000 patients now in our collaborative, 55,000 healthcare professionals in our community who we've trained and can be activated when we go speak to legislators. This number, 69, white percentage, much higher than black, uh, but uh, we were up across all um, uh, racial and ethnic categories. So, so good news, but the gap remains. Uh, we conducted a survey of antimicrobial resistance. Interestingly, five countries we were funded to, to survey. Have you ever heard the word before? So about half have heard the word before, half have not. So compared to sepsis, we're starting from a stronger base. But again, how do you create an activism if someone has never heard of the term? The good news is when we, when we told people what it was and asked them how important is AMR, it became very, very high. They said it's a big problem. It's where I'm very concerned about this. The other piece of good news is that I was at the World AMR Congress early in the month, and the conversation was all about sepsis. And people were saying to us, you know, when we talk about AMR, we have to talk about sepsis because everyone knows about sepsis. I was like, well, they do, um, but I guess everything is relative. So connecting the dots between uh, sepsis and AMR is critically important. So we have a new campaign uh, just launched with Sepsis Awareness Month. Happy Sepsis Awareness Month, September. Infection prevention is sepsis prevention. So really putting a focus on never letting that infection happen in the first place. And that can mean different things in different countries, obviously. Vaccination's a key, key, key ingredient. We're working with Sanofi now in the development of an E. coli UTI vaccine. It would be a game changer. And we're working with them through our partnership for sepsis and aging with 50 state um, departments of aging to get the word out about this so that when it is available, hopefully there'll be large uptake on these vaccinations. Mm -hmm. So um, how have we responded to uh, the AMR problem? We created a campaign called End Superbugs. Uh, it's been very, very effective. We received funding to plaster this all over Washington, DC, bus shelters, out of home advertising, et cetera. A really a tremendous campaign. And really, the key is to make this real, to make it personal. This can happen to you. Imagine your kitchen is on fire and your fire extinguisher doesn't work. What are you going to do? Just wait and hope that the house doesn't burn down? That's the situation we're approaching with AMR. And the big problem with AMR is if you can't treat an infection, how do you get hurt? By that cascade to sepsis. So we need to keep banging that drum. So one of the things we're working on, um, some uh, complementary to what the Stauntons are doing, uh, we introduced in the House of Representatives, bipartisan, Mikey Sherrill from New Jersey and Larry Bouchon from Indiana, Lulu's Law, named after a four-year-old from my neighboring town who passed away from sepsis, tragically, four-year-old, a, a, well, a wealthy family. Lulu's Law calls for two things. One is the creation of a national sepsis data trust like the cancer registries, which was started in the early 90s. When I was a kid, cancer was one thing. We have to beat cancer. To beat cancer, we're done. 463 different types of cancer. We know that because of the cancer registry. And now we can refine our research, our diagnosis, and our treatment of cancer, and mortality has gone down dramatically. We believe there's a tremendous amount of heterogeneity to sepsis that we're only going to get so far with the blunt kind of diagnosis and, and treatments that we have available now. We really need to personalize this between the pathogen and the immune response. It's the immune response. We don't really understand that well right now. So we're looking for this to be a data trust. And it's called a data trust because this is our data. It doesn't belong to the hospitals. It doesn't belong to the insurance companies. It is our data and should be used for the furtherance of better public health. Lulu saw also call, calls for the actual creation of a national sepsis action plan, a true one, like the AMR action plan that exists in the United States. We want something like that for sepsis. And it has really helped in the, in the fight against AMR. We believe it will be equally helpful to have that national full of, full of government response uh, to sepsis through the creation of the National Sepsis Action Plan. Here's our founder with his daughter, Erin. I always get chills because Erin looks a lot like one of my daughters. And there but for fortune, why Aaron and not my daughter? It doesn't make any sense. It was a healthcare associated infection during a routine outpatient surgery, no antibiotics, no follow-up treatment, total lack of care. And we've lost a wonderful young person from the world. Thank you very much. We are also grateful to Dr. Carl Fleckley for establishing the Global Sepsis Awards. 
it is through his personal donation and support that the global leaders in sepsis are recognized every year. And Tom, your each of your presentation is a testimony what a strong media and communication person can do in terms of the amazing engagement of the audience and really conveying very complex messages to to the audience and demystifying sepsis challenges. Thank you so much. As always, extremely impressive and grateful. And we look forward to uh, establishing the Global Sepsis Innovations Platform jointly with the US Sepsis Alliance and Sepsis Stiftung. Our final uh, presenters are Michael Wong, the Executive Director of Physician Patient Alliance for Health and Safety, and Dr. Amy Campbell, Quality Nurse Specialist at the ECU Health Office of Quality Performance Improvement and Analytics. And Michael, thank you for collaborating with the Global Sepsis Alliance for the 2024 edition of the World Sepsis Congress, and we look forward to our future collaborations, please. Yeah, thank you, Miriam, for inviting us to this very important event. We're a a top 100 patient safety organization internationally. We only work on four disease areas, cardiovascular uh, or thrombosis, blood clots, respiratory care, and opioid care, and sepsis. But sepsis to the organization is, how do I say it, very personal. I, or members of our board of advisors, and hundreds of volunteers that help us out throughout the world have either had sepsis or had someone they know have sepsis. So it's very personal to our organization. And so we are absolutely delighted, Miriam, to uh, back and, and support the 2030 Global Agenda for Sepsis. In our, and on our Sepsis Advisory Board, we actually have a physician who was a member of the Surviving Sepsis Campaign, the original member of that. We have a physician who himself contracted sepsis, and he was a patient. And we also have Dr. Amy Campbell, who works every day on sepsis patients. And so I would like to introduce her and have her speak. I'm an, I'm an attorney, so I'll have the clinician talk about sepsis. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. This is such an honor and something that's so dear to my heart. Years ago, when sepsis first came into the hospital and my role as a quality nurse specialist, they said, you know, we want you to work with sepsis and look at the core measure. And they gave me the specs book, which is like this big. And I'm like, wow, how am I even gonna get into this? With How do we do this? And when you look at everything you've heard today, it really, you know, sepsis does not discriminate. We do, you know, our borders, it separates us. Why in some parts of the world do we have these diagnostics and we have these pathways and other places that have, that bear the burden do not. I had the great fortune of working with the Mercy Ships and practicing a little bit in Banana Africa and working with the orphans and working the clinics there where you don't even have clean running water. And how, how did they take care of that UTI? How did they take care of that cut? And how do we prevent sepsis? When I was doing some of my research in post-sepsis syndrome, which you don't hear a lot about, we talk about getting you through. We talk about the continuum and, you know, from early detection. And when you first get that cut and you don't feel right, and then you get to our emergency room, you survive the ICU, you get home, and then you have this chance of developing post-sepsis syndrome. One of my research studies um, participants was talking to me one day and he really, my patients inspire me. They're why I'm here and why I want to talk about sepsis and build these pathways and get research and get funding and make it better for everyone. It's not just a medical necessity that we identify sepsis qu quicker. It's a moral imperative. We shouldn't have children die and we shouldn't have babies die and we shouldn't have elderly die. We should be able to figure this out and be on the front stage for sepsis. So this young man, he was telling me he had a simple fall. He was walking, he slipped, he had a scratch on his leg, but unfortunately developed sepsis. Over time, he had multiple readmissions to sepsis. We don't talk about this either. Once your body decides to have that host response and you develop your systemic inflammatory response syndrome, you can do it again multiple times. He was out to dinner one day with his family. He walks out and he doesn't know where he's at. He doesn't recognize his family. What they realized if he has part of that post sepsis syndrome is almost like a stroke victim. There's times he cannot read. There's times he cannot recognize people, almost like he's got dementia. And he told me, Amy, he said, I wear slip on shoes. 
And I said, well, great. I like tennis shoes too. He said, no, I wear slip on shoes because there's days I don't remember how to tie my shoes. And that story, and I remember because it was during the pandemic and I had my mask on and I had tears. And I was getting a little snotty, I was, you know, and he said, you have to share my story. I need people to understand that this is more than even if you survive it, you've got a really rough road ahead of you. And he still has PTSD. And the last story I'll end with is with another young lady, because I believe these stories have to be told. I believe they are what's going to get people's attention. And it's sad. We shouldn't, you know, you don't want to hear about children dying of sepsis in countries that have all this medicine. But whether you're in our best ICUs or you're in Benin, Africa, we all should know you're septic. We should recognize it and we should treat it the same way. One day I was asked to go see this young lady and I was with a surveyor and I hadn't really looked at the chart. They said, Amy, can you go with her? She's having a procedure done and just go in there, get her acclimated. I said, sure. And I'm walking, I'm bebopping down the hallway and I turn around, I see this very young woman there. And I remember looking at her toes and she had pink toenail polish and I love pink. It's my color. And then I'm like, well, what is she getting done? They said, both of her feet are being removed. And I was like, what in the world? 19 years old, and why were her feet being removed? She'd had sepsis multiple times. She'd been an IV drug user, and we had missed it. And I felt like I failed her. Even though I had never taken care of her, I'm like, she'll never feel the toes, you know, her toes in the sand. She's not going to dance her children's wedding. The rest of her life, she's going to be dealing with this. And this, this should never happen to her. So as I close and, you know, definitely enforcing, you know, endorsing all this work is we have to be the ones to speak up. You know, if we talk to 100 people and tell them about sepsis and tell them, you know, what it looks like, even that small thing that you're ignoring, that tooth, that ear, that red, that red cut, and they understand, whoa, I might be sepsis. I mean, if we do that, if we talk to 100, 100 people you know, it's a 1% chance, you know, that we'll, we're going to get, we're going to start improving over time or 1% that we're able to improve. So early detection, building those systems, all of our, all of our medical records should have these pathways in them. It shouldn't just be certain hospitals have this model of whatever your electronic medical record is, has this checklist, all of our electronic medical records, because we have to have system solutions to do the right thing. Thank you. What an incredible conclusion of our presentations. Amy, thank you so much for voicing your patients because that's the strongest advocacy point, of course, for every action we need. And each of the story, it's like uh, we could see, we could picture what each of the sepsis survivor had to go through. And uh, I'm very grateful for you also that you could make um, time and join us. Thank you sincerely. Again, the time is very limited as we have to allow other um, uh, meeting conveners um, to enter the room, but I cannot close the meeting without recognizing my esteemed colleague, mentor, and um, one of the global health leaders, Ambassador Jimmy Cocker, <laughs> who has led the foundational work on HIV AIDS fight uh, from UNICEF after being the US diplomat. And we look forward, Jimmy, very grateful for you joining us, finding time. And we look forward to discussing and sharing your wisdom also how we can take this um, to the high political level and engaging the decision makers where sepsis deserves to be. We would be delighted if you would like to, you know, share your comments or we can we can definitely continue our discussions. We're way behind schedule and you have wonderful speakers. <laughs> I want to express solidarity and keep them. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks again to your colleagues, friends, advocates, supporters. And let me hereby conclude this meeting with extending gratitude to colleagues who have joined online and hope that next year we will have the main sepsis event at the United Nations with co-sponsorship of the UN member states and leaders in the global sepsis fight. Thank you for your attention.